Hi, my name is Richard Hill and I'm curious. Have you ever had any times in your life when someone seemed to take a real disliking to you even before you had any opportunity to do something irritating or offensive? Or maybe you've had the experience of noticing that around a certain person your behavior becomes completely different. Perhaps you suddenly become totally clumsy or very talkative when you normally aren't. If your answer to any of these questions is yes, then you have already had the experience of transference and projection, the topics I'm going to be discussing for the next 35 minutes or so. It's tempting to think that our interactions with another person are exactly what they seem. Whether gratifying, angry making or disturbing, the emotions and behavior coming from the other person seem to be all theirs nothing to do with us. Yet a whole century ago, Sigmund Freud made the discovery that if we do not look beneath the surface of the unconscious patterns replaying themselves in an encounter, we're likely to miss the whole point of it. If we similarly fail to acknowledge the denied aspects of ourselves, it may be those with which we are unknowingly viewing in another person. The phenomena of transference and projection, although solidly accepted in analytical and uh, psychodynamic schools of psychology in, in which they originated, are nevertheless complex and often misunderstood concepts. Yet some claim that projection is the single most important phenomena in psychotherapy. Now, my aim today is to help you to understand what transference and projection are, how they develop in a therapeutic relationship and what forms they tend to take so that you can recognize them as they occur in your therapy rooms and in your life. For further study, you may also wish to explore two professional development courses provided by the Mental Health Academy, Transference and Projection and Sitting with Shadow. For more information, visit www.mentalhealthacademy.com.au, you should see that on the subtitles there. Let's answer the, the so what first. Why study transference and projection? If you're working in a psychodynamic tradition such as Jungian psychology, then the idea of examining the unconscious exchanges in, a, in an, an encounter especially a therapeutic one, seems not only normal, but it's imperative. Traditions such as cognitive behavioral therapy or transactional analysis, however, are less sensitized to the phenomenon, so study of such interactions may seem irrelevant with these therapies. Yet it is increasingly and widely understood that a person's damaging relationships with others early on constrain his or her ability to make the most of abilities and opportunities. These counterproductive programs for relationships are unconscious and cannot be dealt with directly either by the therapist or the client. Eventually, however, such pathological patterns find their way into the client-therapist relationship. When they do, it gives the skillful therapist the opportunity to help the client to recognize and resolve them ushering in the possibility of real transformation for the client. Most mental health helpers have heard of the terms projection, uh, transference, or therapeutic transference, and also their cousins, projective identification and counter-transference. What do they refer to exactly? The what, defining the terms. Transference is characterized by unconscious redirection of feelings of one person to another. It can occur both in everyday life and also in the therapy room. One example of how it can happen is when a person mistrusts another because the other resembles, say, an ex-spouse in manners, appearance or demeanor. In a therapeutic context, transference refers to the way in which the client's view of and relations with people from childhood are expressed in current feelings, attitudes and behaviours in regards to the therapist. Analyzing this transference has generally been seen, been seen as the, the central feature of psychodynamically oriented techniques. 
projection. Projection is also an unconscious process, like transference. It's considered to be a defense mechanism whereby intolerable feelings or thoughts are externalized and attributed to others. By attributing to or projecting onto other others, one's unacceptable or unwanted thoughts and or emotions, projection reduces the anxiety. Both so-called negative emotion and impulses, such as sadness, resentment, greed, and lust, and also the positive emotions and qualities, such as generosity, creativity, and altruism, can be projected. What we deny within us is often termed our psychological shadow, which becomes the, pr the principal material for projection. Projective identification. This process occurs when a person projects an unwanted or intolerable aspect of him or herself, such as, say, de deceptiveness, onto someone else, behaves towards the other in a way that generates feelings in the other which correspond with the projection and then unconsciously identifies and feels oneness with the other. Projective identification is unconscious and more extreme than projection. It serves a number of purposes for the person projecting in such a way. The most important function is probably that of defense, avoiding painful feelings you know, which have been denied. It also serves as communications, a nonverbal and unconscious means of sharing experience. Instead of telling the therapist about their inner world, clients engage in a projective identification to get the therapist to experience. In this way, they may be able to evoke empathy and understanding. Third, through projective identification, clients secure a container outside of themselves, which can hold and manage the unwanted feelings. And fourth, it is a way of relating to another person, relationship being all important in psychotherapy. Finally, if the therapist is able to respond appropriately, projective identification can be a pathway for psychological change. Appropriately here means that the therapist agrees to hold the material for a while for the client so that he or she can examine it as it appears in the therapist and hopefully come to realize that it is safe at some stage to take it back. Some therapists have differentiated between projection and projective identification by noting that with projection, a person has more choice as to whether or not to accept the projection, where with projective identification there's a strong element of coercion, even though it's usually unconscious. Countertransference. While this concept has shifted over the years, the general consensus now is that countertransference is the therapist's emotional reactions in response to the client's transference and projective identifications. More generally, it can refer to a therapist's emotional entanglement with a client. In psychoanalytical and psychodynamic psychotherapy, such as object relations therapy, transference and countertransference are not deemed to be bad. Rather, they are mined by the therapist for the useful information they contain about the client's processes. To understand how a transference projection develops, let us view it as part of the total architecture of therapy. A summary of Sheldon Kashtan's four-stage model can give us a thumbnail picture of this view. Stage one, engagement. Clients come into therapy with misgivings, fears, discomfort, and often ambivalence about being there. Shortly after beginning treatment, the client may actually feel worse and wonder if he or she made the right decision by entering therapy. So the, the goal at this stage is to ensure that the client stays in treatment. Clients need a safe, caring relationship and to not have the therapy gallop ahead of them you know, before they're ready. So the focus is on engagement, not on making interpretations. Discussion should go beyond the presenting problem, but the therapist should resist the temptation to do something. What the therapist does appropriately do at this stage is link factual client statements to affect, thus conveying empathetic understanding. 
for example, interventions such as, you seem upset when you talk about this topic. An indication that engagement has been attained and that this stage is coming to an end occur when the client says that he or she is feeling better and begins to look forward to therapy sessions. Many clients believe they're cured at this stage and, well, perhaps want to stop coming. The wise therapist, however, must find a way to acknowledge the growth that has happened so far, but help the client to understand that the roots of the problem may not yet have been reached. If anything, only the surface might have been scratched. Stage two, projective identification. As human beings, we construct a template for how to do relationship early on in our lives. It's constituted from how our primary caregivers, uh, re giver or givers, are uh, related to us. We then take the template, including all the unfinished business of thwarted impulses and unmet needs, and try to inappropriately, well, stuff it into a surrogate who seems at some unconscious level as though they might be able to follow our unconscious instructions for how to behave with them in relationship. The therapist is that surrogate. So at stage two, relational pathology begins to emerge. The client begins to session his or her template and begins to put it on or even into the therapist. Projective identifications now develop. The projector, the client, exerts unconscious but nevertheless often strong pressure on the therapist to accept and identify with the projections. The client projector may believe, albeit unconsciously, something about the therapist that is not totally true, but by relating to the therapist as if it were true, the therapist may identify with the client in a process called introjective identification. When this happens, the therapist can alter his or her usual behaviour to make the projection come true. And this is all done on an unconscious level. To explain how the therapist becomes drawn into the client's pathology and experiences an, an emotional reaction to the projective identification, thus completing the projective process, let's take an example of a projective identification of dependency. I, I think that might help. It's complex, I know. In, in this case, the client will make attempts to force the therapist into the role of saviour, such as by often asking for advice or experiencing frequent crises uh, requiring emergency phone calls. The likely counter-transference of the therapist kicks in, with the therapist feeling overprotective of the client and having a strong urge to help the client. It's best to resist the urge to be helpful in such ways because doing so only succeeds in reinforcing pathology. Once the projective identification has arrived well, in the room, the therapist's goal is to bring it and the associated metacommunications out into the open, thus bringing the whole relationship into the room. In the dependency example we're following, the goal of the therapist is to get the client to directly acknowledge, I cannot survive without you. Of course, the catch is that being nice and accommodating people, therapists want to help their clients. To not offer the help, sympathy and guidance asked for is very difficult. As therapists, however, we are encouraged to stand by our boundaries, thus resisting this urge to obey the client's demands or needs, which would reinforce the existing pathology. On some level, the client knows that the way they are in relationship with people isn't working. Stage three, confrontation. The therapist presented with the projection responds to the metacommunication of it by steadfastly refusing to obey or conform to the demand. This is obviously uncomfortable for the client who perceives it as a, a rejection. But by saying no to the client's projective identification, the therapist is challenging the validity of the projective identification as a basis for relationship. The therapist bests intervention is in two parts. First, affirming the relationship, making it clear that the projective identification and not the client is being rejected. And also, staying steadfast in refusing to act from the introjected identification, 
Taking this option, however, means that the therapist must deal with often intense client responses to the confrontation. Intensification. This could be responses such as self-harming or threatening suicide, blaming uh, the therapist, of course, and secondary projective identifications, forcing the therapy back to stage two, or leaving, terminating treatment. By the end of stage three, the therapeutic relationship has calmed down. The client begins to see the maladaptive ways of relating to the therapist are no longer viable, and she, he, begins to interact differently with the therapist. Stage four, termination. At this stage, the therapist gives feedback about what it was like to be the object of the client's projective identification and about how the client is perceived by others. The therapist helps the client to see how his or her early relationships have affected behavior with others. There's a letting go of pathological object relations, and then separation, wherein client and therapist share feelings about the ending of the relationship. Getting a handle on the overall course of therapy with a, a focus on where the projective identification uh, would come in and how they get worked through. It's important, but it's also necessary to recognize the principal forms of transference and of uh, projective identification. The indicators of how a client was affectively traumatized appear in the form of transference takes. By determining which type or form of transference the client is exhibiting, the therapist is better able to search for the seed that was thwarted in the client's development. Three basic types of needs arise from early development. First, to have one's competent performance validated and approved. Second, to be protected and supported at times of stress, of tension that are beyond the competence of the infant or child to manage satisfactorily. And third, to be acknowledged by one's kin as a fellow being. When any of these needs go significantly unmet or, or somehow misunderstood, they tend to be eventually transferred to the therapist in the therapeutic relationship. Heinz Kahoot referred uh, to these types of patterns respectively as the mirror, idealizing, and alter ego transferences. So let's look at the mirror transference. Psychotherapist Michael Bash notes that nothing is as reinforcing for the baby as establishing a contingent relationship between her behavior and what is happening in the outer environment. Recruiting an appropriate, validating, affective response from the parent is especially critical for seeking competence in communication and in autonomous behavior. The mirror transfer, transference, now that demonstrates the client's need or wish for such validation from the therapist. The idealizing transference is if we imagine the contentment and sense of safety and reassurance a small child feels when carried firmly but lovingly in his parents' arms. Then we can understand the basis for the idealizing reaction. As human beings, we have an ongoing longing to be strengthened and protected when necessary by being connected to be an admired, powerful figure. This yearning gives rise to the idealizing transference. It's a need to be united with someone that we can look up to and who can provide us with the inspiration, the strength, and, and whatever else we need to maintain the stability of our self-system when we feel frustrated or endangered or have lost our sense of meaning. The alter ego transference. The alter ego transference answers a basic human need. The need to have one's humanness, one's kinship, or sameness with others of the same species quietly acknowledged. Here the child is simply being quietly sustained by another in whose presence he or she feels accepted. 
the little boy who brings his play tools and workbench to the garage to work alongside his dad at the big workbench uh, is an example of this, uh, as is the little girl who dresses up in mum's shoes or clothing. When transference is experienced as a powerful coercion, it may be occurring as one of the projective identifications, which are about decoding the client's orders. The projective identifications. Projective identifications, as I noted in the phenomenon of being obedient to our client's processes, uh, as therapists, we take on identifications projected unconsciously from our clients who are requiring or even commanding us to be a certain way in order for their world to view to be substantiated. We can register surprise that the process of projective identification is as effective as it is. Now, after all, why would any sane thinking therapist subject him or herself to acting totally out of character all of a sudden with a client, especially when the new behavior may be less than desirable? And the answer may be just as surprising. For all the work that most therapists believe that they have done on themselves, the reality is that client projective identifications succeed partly because the projected material somehow resonates with us. There is some aspect of it which finds what psychotherapist Peter Hubbard calls an anchor within us. So let us take a practical example of how that works. Let's say that a client is commanding us to be sexually attracted to him or her. Given the overwhelming taboo of any sexual encounter at all with clients, most therapists would be horrified to discover that they were actually getting aroused by a client. But the anchor in this case may be that the client is just the sort of person uh, that we would tend to be attracted to. The reason to include information about the anchor here is that we cannot deeply understand projective identification without including our role in the whole process, including our counter-transference, which is also very real. Early psychodynamic therapies tried to do just that. But since the advent of object relations therapy and relationships, and the attempts to replicate unsatisfying early ones are acknowledged as the holy grail of psychotherapeutic healing. So the relationship with a therapist is the cornerstone of the psychotherapy. And the part of that relationship is how the therapist is affected by the client. With that caveat in mind, let's turn to an explanation of the principal types of projective identification with an eye to decoding them. Kashtan outlined four main types of projective identifications to do with dependency, power, sexuality, and ingratiation. Hubbard, working from the transpersonal psychology of psychosynthesis, identifies a fifth, which is projective identifications invoking the sublime. We look at each in terms of the relational stance that the client is taking up, the consequent metacommunication what the command or induction to the therapist is, and the implied or else, the deep-seated need that, that the projective material is attempting to meet or defend against. Here's a quick look at Cash Dan's chart. Let's explore each of the projective identifications. Dependency. The aim of dependency projective identification is to force the other to help. Those employing such a defense mechanism look for someone else to offer help and support to them, even though they can usually work the problem out for themselves. Despite the innocent appearance of the calls for help, the underlying message on the covert communication level, level is, I cannot live without you. Such projections are expressions like, 
What do you think? What should I do? Can you help me? And I do not think that I can do that alone. If people using dependency projective identification do not get the help they are coercing others to provide, they can respond with hysterical crying, depression, and even suicidal tendencies. Often their early childhood, covert, messages from caregivers were, the more you obey your mother's orders, the more your mother loves you. What is so challenging for the therapist, especially a newly trained one, is that the requests for advice or help made by the client in establishing the projective identification are often, well, really plausible. One new mother with profound post-traumatic stress disorder from multiple sources asked if the therapist could come to her home or as she couldn't get a babysitter in order to go to the therapist's room, nor could she leave the breastfeeding baby for very long. A borderline client explained to a therapist that she really wanted to come to therapy, but the therapist's room were a 45-minute walk from the nearest bus stop at the, at the hour she wished to come, and she had no car. Could the therapist, she asked politely, come pick her up from the bus stop? She really, really wanted to come for the session, she said. It seems that more women than men use this projection, identification. Power. Have you ever been in the therapy room or in regular life with someone around whom you are suddenly very incompetent. You know, whether you, your, your sudden new behaviours, uh, you can't park properly, you, you, you give a poor presentation uh, when you usually give a really good one, or just forgetting things that you would normally tell a client. The chances are that if you don't experience yourself in this way with most other people, you're the recipient of a power projective identification. In this defence mechanism, there is the desire to dominate others by making them feel insufficient. The covert messages are, do exactly what I say, obey me, you cannot live without me. There is the belief that the other cannot do anything right unless he or she behaves like the projector. Mentally or physically handicapped, chronically diseased or alcoholic parents who cannot care for their children and who indeed require care from the child often produce children who feel unwanted and in danger of being abandoned. Because it's too scary to imagine mother abandoning them, such children imagine that they control mother's behaviour and in dreams and fantasies live as though they do. The seeming flip side of dependency, power, takes control as its relational stance. The projector's meta-communication to you as a therapist is that you can't survive without him or her. So she or he needs to make you be or act incompetent so that it can be demonstrated that he or she is powerful and needed. Of course, what the person really needs is to be able to separate, individuate, and know him or herself as whole, regardless of who else is around to interact with. But that's far too scary on its own. It's, it's much easier to go for power over another with threats to leave. Um, it should be the legitimacy of the power to be challenged. If this doesn't make sense, take for evidence of this dynamic the typical abuser. He never seems to be the one terminating the relationship. Even though he claims that she is so bad, you know, however you know, he defines it, you know, that she needs to be beaten fairly regularly, she, she's, she's never bad enough that he actually leaves. So the relationship gets broken up when she finally finds the strength to decide that she isn't incompetent and helpless as, as she's been led to believe or, or had projected onto her. Once she knows herself as competent and self-reliant, well, the gig's up. She's gone. She needs... A new he needs a new recipient for the projection. Power is more typically a male projected identification, although emotive, amuse, uh, emotionally abusive projected identification is sometimes seen amongst females as, as a form of dominating power. In the therapy room, power and control issues can be around everything from how and when the sessions are scheduled to topics the therapist is not allowed to discuss, to rebukes for what the therapist has done wrong, 
One highly narcissistic woman in couples counselling severely criticised the therapist for accepting as a gift a book written by her husband, of, of whose work she was intensely jealous. The woman said nothing when her husband presented it to the therapist in one session, but she came in in the next time extremely angry that the therapist had incompetently and unethically accepted something from him that had nothing to do with our couple's counselling. <laughs> oh yeah, nothing at all. You can see the message here. Sexuality. In the too hot to handle category, there is always sex. The person who uses a sexuality projective identification forces the other to experience erotic reactions. Messages with sexual content are projected as covert communication. The person using the projective identification may have been the child whose mother gave him the covert message, you're desired as long as you make me feel excited and stimulate me. As different from relationships that have normal sexual content, ones in which there is sexuality projective identification do not have a spontaneously arising sexual function. They're not impulsive. Integration. The self-denying person who always puts her own needs last is the one likely to use ingratiation, projective identification. Having learned in childhood that she would be regarded as valuable and even loved, if she were useful, she now understands in adulthood that she must always do things for others in order to gain the other's love. We need the coercive aspects of the projection, however, where she is disappointed. The other person will be criticised or called to account for what he has or has not done, even though there is unlikely to have been an explicit agreement that he, he would do the things he's being told off for not doing. Messages such as, you did not appreciate the value of what I did for you. And I sacrificed my time, money, resources, effort, you know, whatever, for you. Are found in the covert or sometimes direct communication. The recipients of ingratiation projective identification generally feel obliged to express gratitude. Because the aim of the person using this mechanism is to be appreciated. And the need is for self-appreciation. One of the meta-communications is... You belong to me. One therapist had a lovely client named Mark, highly educated and well-known on the speaker circuit uh, in his area. Mark came to the therapy with the relentless mantra, I'm not good enough. In therapy, he was a very cooperative, hard-working client, trying every suggestion that came out of the sessions in order to start feeling better about himself. He reckoned that the therapy was working, and before too long was in a habit of saying at least once uh, during every session, I appreciate you to the therapist. Mark registered to attend a day-long course the therapist was running. He arrived on a somewhat brilliant sunny day, saying with mock sternness to the therapist, you're competing with sunshine, which really was code for, you should really appreciate me for being here under such conditions. He made similar remarks about his efforts at other times. The therapist believed that they had a good therapeutic alliance but she noticed that she always felt obliged to go the extra mile for Mark. Her rationalisation that he deserved it may have been her recipient's reaction to an ingratiating induction. You owe me. Sublime. Less well known than Cash Dan's four types of projective identification is this one identified by Hubbard. A person whose relational stance is devotion obeisance or worship should, in the full flowering of the New Age, not be surprised, not be, not be a surprise yet, get a sublime projection identification may not always be easy to spot. Moreover, it does not appear on the surface to be as lethal as some of the other projective identifications. It's about those who are unable to own their own divinity, projected onto somebody else, someone chosen as the guru to carry their their inner gold, as James Robin Johnson calls it, uh, for them. The would-be disciple conveys the meta-communications, connect me, bless me, enlighten me. The recipient of the projection is ordered to be divine and godlike and 
most certainly not allowed to have feet of clay. This projective identification is illustrated well in the movie The Man Who Would Be King. In it, Sean Connery plays a person who travels to a remote region of a developing country. The symbol of his pendant is the same as that held by the natives of the region, who are awaiting a king. They've been told that uh, when their king, who is held in tribal legend to be a demigod, finally comes to them, he will be, he will be uh, wearing, you know, bearing that, that symbol. The natives accordingly make the Connery character into their king. They project onto him their disowned divine selves. And the Connery character, for his part, strives to be kingly, if not perfectly godlike, and all is well in the kingdom for a while. The natives know, however, that a true king, being godlike, never bleeds. The induction to be perfect or godlike. So things fall apart one day when the king sustains a slight wound and starts bleeding. The result in disappointment is too great for the king's worshippers, the, the people of the region, and they see that their king cannot carry their projection, and in accordance with the or else of this projective identification, they crucify him. Well, sort of, they behead him. But the sublime projective identification in the therapy room may be the client who sees the therapist as the enlightened one with all the answers. If ever there was a halo effect, it would be seen in the aura perceived by such projectors around the recipient of the projected sublime urges, you know, deserved, realistic or not. Even for truly humble therapists who make no pretensions to perfection or enlightenment, there's a strong pull to act from the covert commands to be divine. As with other projected identifications, there is likely to come a day when the therapist does something wrong. A little late for an appointment, falls asleep during a session, it's not good, but it does happen. Make some remark that the client finds offensive. As the therapist slips off the pedestal under which he or she has been thrust, there's a vivid real life opportunity in subsequent relating to show the client that even though the therapist may have slipped off the pedestal, divinity is still a valid attribute to own. It can be managed by holding a point of tension with one's eminent humanity. The part that comes late gets sleepy in session and sometimes makes insensitive remarks. For the client to see that it's possible to live up to divinity, now that it is acceptably mixed with humanity, the client may be willing to take back his projected material, the inner gold that was too frightening to own before. Thus there can be a happier ending, without crucifixion or beheading, which is helpful, for the man who would be king for themselves. Reviewing the table of projective identifications and consequent behaviours engendered in both client and therapist, we can smile a little at ourselves as a species. We truly do some amazing psychological contortions in order to gain that all-important acceptance. Yet looking more soberly at these defence mechanisms, we can appreciate how projective identifications are attempts to repair, or undo or mitigate serious levels of psychopathology in the self. In the happiest scenario, the wise therapist can pick up on what is happening with the client and allow the projected material to come into him or herself as an introjected identification, which he or she can then, over time, patiently and compassionately, transmute and hand back to the client with the earnest metacommunication, hey, I've carried this stuff for a while and detoxified it, it's no longer radioactive, it will be safe for you to take back into yourself now, and you need it back, it's part of you. So such projections can, when accepted and properly worked with, be turned into empathetic tools in order to make or re-establish contact with a client. Originating an obstacle or, uh, to the client's growth, they can be transformed through skillful therapist effort and compassionate bearing on them into instruments of that same growth. And during this talk, I have defined transference and related processes and explained the mechanisms by which they operate. I have outlined the stages of a projective identification in the therapeutic process. I have identified the forms of transference and discussed five 
major projective identifications. In finishing, can I ask, was any of this a surprise? Were you in any way astonished to learn that the appropriate way to deal with projective material therapeutically is to allow it to happen? Because transferred material is a communication, albeit unconscious, from our client, their hopes, again, they are unconscious, and not always met if we remain blocked or shut off from their communications or, or fail altogether to recognize the interactive pressure. True, such communications are an infiltration of the mind and the body of the therapist, but in acknowledging this, we agree to walk a narrow type road, being willing to embody our client's experience and really identify with what they cannot, thus not falling off the side of unempathetic judgment of them, and at the same time maintaining a psychological distance from them so as not to fall off the side of acting from a similar pathology to theirs. That is the anchor in us. We're horrified at the idea that we would use our clients for our own psychological growth. So we diligently monitor our own counter-transference, supported by ongoing commitment to adequate supervision and our own personal therapy. Get into grips with projection and transference, as subtle and as slippery as they are, can be a long and frustrating process for the therapist, but it is crucial for the therapeutic relationship, that we become acutely aware of its presence in our rooms.